to continue my theme that I gave last year in some ways by looking at a little bit of the what I call the Oriental connections, not necessarily influence, but connections. So some of this is going to be looking at comparative mythology, um, comparisons between what I like to call Eurasian, the Eurasian kind of myth complex. Um, has anyone here heard of Urashima the Fisherman? Yes. Thank you. Uh, but I'm assuming the vast majority of you haven't. Uh, but um, everyone's heard of Smith, as Walter Major, and I gather a number of you would have heard of. Right, this is why I've got to apologise both to Japanese and Irish pronunciation. Oishin? Yeah. Thank you. Great. Oshin. Oshin. Thank you. Okay. But so most people have heard of the, the story of Oshin as well. Yeah. Great. Um, to me, this was kind of quite new. Um, so here is a sort of late 19th century um, Japanese print of Urashima in his fishing boat encountering a turtle. And I'll tell you about the significance of that later. Uh, for me, this started almost exactly a year ago, because on the Sunday after last Oxford, I bought that book there, in a bookshop here in Oxford. And in a sort of mild sense of stupor, as you tend to have after Oxford, <laughs> on the train back home, I was leafing through that. And I came across the story of Urashima, and suddenly I became very wide awake, uh, because, you know, your mind is full of Oxford, it's full of Tolkien, I suddenly went, oh my word, you know, there are certain similarities here. <laughs> so let me take this through, you through this. Who is Urashima? Well, as you can see on the slide, he's the fisherman, went out, he caught a turtle, that was seen on the imprint before, transformed into a, I'll call her a supernatural woman, because, you know, there's various sort of terminologies. Uh, she's sometimes referred to as a fairy princess, in some versions she's given a name, Otohima, uh, and she lives in, uh, on an eternal mountain, uh, this is Mount Penglai in Chinese, or Horai San, or Mount Horai uh, in Japanese. And this is a, a kind of miraculous island, the island where nobody dies, a lonely island. I think you're beginning to get to see certain similarities here. Um, Urashima marries the princess, and he lives with her for, again, it varies. Some stories say three years, some say 30 years other lengths of time. Anyway, at the end of it, he becomes homesick and she gives him permission to return. Now, he's given a token, he's given a jeweled box um, and the strict instructions, if you want to have a happy ending, do not open this box. So take this box with you, go back, go home, visit your parents, but don't open the box. Of course, what happens? He comes home and finds nobody is alive anymore who uh, he knew. One old guy says, oh, actually, yes, 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 my grandfather told me there was a chap who sailed out and, you know, was never seen again. Anyway, 300 years have passed. He is so distraught, curiosity overtakes him, and, you know, nothing better to do, so he opens the box. Um, and, of course, the, the kind of smoke, the spirit of the princess emerges from this. She disappears forever, he's lost her forever, and he himself, of course, ages instantly by 300 years. In some stories, he doesn't die instantly, but, you know, lives on as a decrepit old man and, you know, completely lost. Um, so that, as you'll see, has many parallels with the story of Oshin. Um, now, I'd like just to tell you a little bit about the reception of this, because these are the last two points on the, um, on the slide there. Uh, because in terms of how these stories or types travel around the world, I think this one is quite interesting, because it's first... It's not the first recording. One of the first recordings of it is in a chronicle, a proper historical chronicle, um, written or finalised in 720 AD in our reckoning, uh, called the Nihongi, or Nihon Shoki. Again, I apologise for the pronunciation, isn't quite right. Uh, so these are chronicles of Japan. Um, this was translated into English in um, 1896. There's one translation by W.G. Aston. And I'll just read you what he writes. So this is the direct translation. Um, in the autumn, the seventh month, a man of um, a district in the province of Tamba, the child of Urashima, went fishing in a boat. At length, he caught a large tortoise, which straight away became changed into a woman. Hereupon, Urashima's child fell in love with her and made her his wife. They went down together into the sea and reached Horai San, Mount Horai, where they saw the genie. Now, Aston translates what's probably Kami as genie, but Kami might also be the fairies. 
in the widest sense, it now gives a fairy land. But like I say, this is a translation of 1896, so something that was well known and around when Tolkien was a student. So in theory, you know, he could have accessed this. I'm not saying he had, I'm just saying it's a possibility. Um, but then the Hobbit Chronicles refer to this event as happening some 300 years before the Chronicle. So it's actually given a precise dating in our reckoning about 477, 478 AD. So it's regarded as a historic event. And I mention this because when we get to the, um, the Celtic stories, there's, there's always a dispute as to how much the Celtic stories are influenced by the Christian one bringing the writing. In Japan, the writing system was taken over, was brought in by China around the oh, 5th, 6th century. Um, so the time when this was recorded is still early enough, I think, to contain these kernels of earlier stories without any overlay. Um, just a quick sort of show, if you Google just Hiroshima in images in Google, you get some, oh, what's it, 47,000 or so. Um, and you get a nice mixture of older Japanese, modern Japanese, modern fantasy influence. I mean, you know, this one here, Atlantis sort of legend, you know, it's wonderful stuff. So I'm just bring this up to show you how incredibly popular this story still is, and also um, how it seems to have you know, traversed from the Far East into parts of Western culture as well. Now, the other world of Hiroshima. Um, I like to bring in objects, tangible objects. So again, after last year, when I started investigating this, um, I happened to be in the British Museum, and there is, this is my very bad photo of the object in the British Museum. This is from the British Museum's website, so it's a detail of that mirror up there. Um, it was depictions of the island of immortality, or the land of the ever young, however you want to do it. So, as I said, in Chinese it's referred to as Peng Lai. It probably derives from Chinese Taoist thinking, the, the mountain of the immortals, the land of the immortals, uh, Mount Hora in Japanese, as I said. But interestingly, um, when the Chinese characters are transcribed into the Japanese um, syllabic system, katakana, I think. Hiragana? Katakana. Hiragana. Um, it's rendered Tokoyo no Kuni, the land, the eternal land. So it's the land that is eternal, um, which again, it's a bit funny, but it's leading on to the kind of semantic association with Tolkien's notion of the undying lands. Yeah? Um, and of course, that brings us to Tir Nanok in the Irish region, again, the undying, the eternal lands. Um, this is a mirror from, um, this is still in a museum in, in Japan. Um, I couldn't get a better reproduction of it, but it shows various mountains in a sea, and I think a chap sitting on the back of a turtle. So that, I reckon, is Hiroshima on his way to the eternal land. And so to Oshin. Now, um, since I'm right, I guess, you know, most of you will have heard of the story of Oshin. I don't think I really need to um, kind of tell you more of the background about it. Um, you've got a nice summary here from, you know, basically any random dictionary of mythology or whatever will do. So here's the one from the LaRousse Dictionary, just a neat summary of, of what happens in the story. And I think the, um, sorry, and there's an image I just grabbed off the internet of Sheen as an old man. What I'm trying to say is that basically the story of Sheen is pretty much the story of a Sheen of the fisherman. The main difference is Hiroshima is a fisherman, Oshin is a warrior, but all the other elements are pretty much there. Um, yeah. So, how does that kind of tie in? So I'd like to kind of backtrack a bit now and have a look at Tolkien, Tolkien's background. Um, as we know, Tolkien's use of Celtic material in the widest sense um, is kind of controversial because Tolkien professed a uh, dislike and denial of using um, Celtic material, but he did use it. And Demetra Feeney's article here on the Celtic type of legends and Tolkien studies has looked at that to some degree. Um, interestingly enough, in Tolkien's own um, work, especially that seminal essay on fairy stories, you actually get a lot more hints and you get a lot more um, kind of sense that he is actually using comparative method. Um, so, for example, um, 
when he also when he looks when he then uh, writes about Beowulf, um, he tries to associate some of the uh, supposed fictional characters in Beowulf, like Hrothgar, Higelac, Beowulf himself. He tries to position them in the late fifth century, so he treats them as historic characters. Um, you can you can almost like, apply philology to Tolkien's or to, to any kind of academic work by looking at what kind of language they use. So when Tolkien refers to Shield Schiffin as a culture hero, that term culture hero is a term that anthropologists and ethnologists in the 20s, 30s, 40s were using. Yeah? If I read a modern text now and it's got um, uh, that dreadful word hermeneutics in it, I haven't got a clue what it means, but it immediately tells me it must have been written after 1980 or so. Yeah? So you can, you can use that philological method and turn it onto the scientific or academic text itself. Um, so when I look, read Tolkien on Beowulf or on fairy stories, it tells me he has actually read an awful lot about kind of cross-cultural anthropological stuff, as was available to him at the time. So one of the things, for example, he mentions in our fairy stories is the um, Swahili tale, uh, as he calls it, of the monkey's heart. And he got that from, I reckon, from the Lilac Fairy Book by Andrew Lang, because that's where it appears in. The monkey's heart um, also appears in an English translation um, in a book on Japanese fairy tales by a very famous guy called Lafcadio Hearn, who um, lived in Japan um, for a number of years, married a Japanese lady, did a lot of work on um, bringing sort of Japanese culture, stories, legends in it in translation, kind of making it familiar in the West. And um, the story there um, is called the silly jellyfish, but it's the same topic. Instead of a monkey, it's a jellyfish who is, who is, is silly. Um, and instead of a sultan, we have a dragon king. Um, and instead of the monkey's heart as the object of desire, um, it's the monkey's liver. So, you know, there's a slight shift, but it's basically the main topics are there. Um, so Japan and the east coast of Africa, where it is, are about as far apart geographically as Japan and uh, Western Europe and Ireland, if I use a sheen. But the same story is told in both regions. So this would strongly argue for either a common origin or diffusion. This is the sort of stuff that was actually occupying people in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. Um, also, Tolkien used a number of real-world influences um, and acknowledged those. Uh, late in life, in a letter of 19, May 1972 to a Mr. Wrigley, he, quote, he said, quote, it is the particular use in a particular situation of any motive, whether invented, deliberately borrowed, or unconsciously remembered, that is the most interesting thing to consider. So he's acknowledging these different ways of where material can come from. And uh, Mark Atherton, in his recent book on the, uh, the emphasis on The Hobbit, um, refers to, you know, uh, partly uh, a mixture of mood and cultural background. So you might not always be directly able to trace, ah, yeah, Tolkien read this book, that's where he got it from. But I think it's perfectly legitimate to you know, use these associations and, and, and wider contexts. So um, let me just now, sorry, the boring tables. So what have we got? If we um, try and, and actually kind of, it's like a structuralist analysis of the stories, okay? So we've got Hiroshima, we've got Oshin, Oshin, and we've got Smith of Wooden Major. So as you can see, I mean, I'll, read, I'll leave you to kind of scan some of this yourself. Um, Hiroshima and Oshin have many similarities. Yeah, the location of the other world is in the sea. In Smith, it's on land. Um, Hiroshima and Oshin marry the other world, female, fairy, whatever. Smith just meets her. Um, the, le the length of time spent there, and that's the interesting thing. Smith can dip in and out. Yeah, he can come and go. Hiroshima and Oshin go once and then never again. They spend what appears to be a short time for them there. But anyway. Um, so that's to do with the wish to return to this world, the token. Yeah? Hiroshima has the box um, that he then opens. Oshin is given not so much a token, he's given a warning, a geese, a kind of taboo. Um, Smith, of course, has his star, that's his token, like Hiroshima's box. Um, and it's how these characters then react with the token or the magic object. The first two defy the prohibition. Yeah? Hiroshima opens the box. 
O'Sheen, in one of those versions, dismounts from the horse, even though he's told he's got to stay on the horse. Smith is the only one who sticks to it, because he's told, you know, at some point or another, you have to relinquish the star, and it has to go on to the next person. And Smith does that. And that is why nothing bad happens to him. So it's that last line there, that last um, sort of row. Um, I think this is where we get to the difference. Okay. So assume Rashid Machine have many similarities. Smith stands out because of something in red. Tolkien's idea of you catastrophe. Okay. The fairy tales. Those others have catastrophic endings. Urashima either ages or dies, or she ages or dies. But Smith lives on. He's lost fairy, but he lives on. Uh, and the token is passed on to the next recipient. Um, so I'd say the main difference, or the notable difference, between Urashima and Urashima on the one hand and Smith on the other is this matter of the ending. So Smith ends in new catastrophe, so dear to con the Tolkien's concept of fairy tales, while Urashima and Urashima's fates um, can on no account be called a happy turn of events. So when Tolkien writes in fairy tales, that fairy tales are you catastrophic, I think he is actually grossly simplifying and flattening his theories. Since evidently neither story of Oshim nor the tale of Hiroshima have even remotely happy endings. Yeah. Uh, the tale of Smith of Whitton Major, however, does have. Uh, so if you acknowledge that Tolkien used these influences from much earlier tales from across the Eurasian kind of sphere, you could argue that the one truly original element that Tolkien brought to fa the fairy tale genre is the idea of you catastrophe. Yeah, he could borrow as much as he likes, but the you catastrophe notion is the, the original one. So let me try and wrap this up. Um, so you know, I, I hope I've shown that there are similarities between all three stories. That the older folk tale, as opposed to the literary adaptation or version that Tolkien brings, the older Urashima Oshin are closely related types. Tolkien brings in that unique stamp of new catastrophe. Um, if you want to delve into these wider connections, you could cite a number of other um, Celtic otherworld visits. Um, there's Bran, I think that's even earlier than the Oshin stories. There's also derived from the Celtic, but it's mentioned by um, an English courtier called Walter Mapp, uh, courtier's trifle, it's early 13th century. Um, he introduces the figure of King Hurler. Now, King Hurler becomes um, the, the leader of the wild hunt, doomed forever to ride round hunting. And Hurler becomes degenerate in kind of um, early modern, modern period, becomes Harlequin. Harlequin of Punch and Judy. So you can see how the descent of what are quite sort of heavy going topics into children's story or kind of pantomime entertainment. Yes. Um, some of these things that uh, are cross cultural, cross Urashima, Urashima Smith, are of course the idea of the different flow of time. So you know, the amount of time spent in fairyland tends to be less than um, spent on Earth. I think there's one Celtic story where it's the other way around. Um, there's this idea of once you've eaten the food, yeah? so if you're living, if you're Urashima or Urashima, and you're living with the fairy, you're eating the food, and the food keeps you there, it has these sort of magical properties. And of course, entering fairy comes at a price, I mean, not for nothing did Tolkien call it the perilous realm. So it's best traversed safely with this magic object. Um, Tolkien likes his star, so Smith has given the star, and Erendel has the Silmaril. Uh, Urashima's box I find quite fascinating, because think of Pandora's box, I'm not saying that there's a connection there. Um, interestingly enough, um, the jeweled box that Urashima has, um, the, the um, box in uh, Smith also becomes embellished in the course of the story. It starts off as plain box, but then later on it becomes... Uh, it was polished now and adorned with silver scrolls. Uh, there's no box in machines. I just wonder if Tolkien perhaps had read, um, you know, one of these Japanese fairy tales. Um, and of course, um, if uh, you're breaking the rules around these magic objects, then disaster ensues, um, which is something that uh, Tolkien's as I'd argue, a unique concept of eucatastrophe manages to avoid. Um, last but not least, um, 
one thing that I, I think perhaps we can take away from this cross-cultural comparison is that um, because Tolkien is embodying or taking in or being influenced by these older, widely known and, and wide, culturally widely diffused tales, I think that is what makes Tolkien's appeal beyond the English language realm. Yeah? The, the, this use of the older material, the Eurasian myths in the widest sense, and Tolkien's tapping into, let's call it, the roots of the tree of story, means that these themes and kernels of such story are familiar to a wide range of peoples, um, people from all over. And, then, you know, and if people are familiar with things, they like to read it again and again. If Tolkien had only written a mythology for England, as he claimed he intended, his stories and his secondary world creations would have been forever stuck with a tiny readership in a small, insignificant corner of the world, a somewhat damp island <laughs> to the west of Europe, that's it, left Europe. Um, as it is, precisely because so much of Tolkien's legendarium has resonances to this wider world, um, of the myths and the legends of, you know, at least the Eurasian language, he is still read by millions and his works have been translated into numerous languages outside of Europe as well. Thank you. Yeah, that's what would be really interesting would be to know who the publisher was. And because it's David Nutt, for example, we know that Tolkien wrote mm. other fairy stories published by David Nutt. He, didn't, he might have done Joseph Jacobs, he certainly did the story of Alexander, which Tolkien read in that edition, which Doug and Susan first. So he could have read it from the library. And also, was it in an anthology of lots of different stories from different cultures? or just No, one? no. The Aston thing, um, I got an edition um, 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 by Tuttle, which is a modern publisher who specialises in translation into English of, of, of Japanese material, you know, 1972. But it just said in the kind of imprint, imprimatur, first published 1896. But I'm sure anyone who's got access to um, Google right now could find out who the publisher was. There is another um, kind of chronicle collection of myth called the Kojiki. Now that was first translated into English by Basil Hall Chamberlain, who was a famous um, linguist and scholar of Japan. And he first read his translation of the Kojiki in 1882, I think, to a learned society in London or Oxford. What I'm saying is, ever since the kind of um, opening of, of, or forced opening of Japan to Western Europe, so basically since sort of at least the 1860s, lots and lots of the, this material is coming in. Japan is incredibly exciting for the kind of fjord de siècle of um, Western Europe. And Tolkien owned a couple of Japanese prints. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to get a few more questions in because I'm going to start the next talk. I'm Maddox next, and then I'll take you. I'll oh, well, you know, some contribution more. I say, actually, yes, I see your point about connection. Surely, both at magic objects, pebble, and spent, finding you spend a lot of time, common themes are sort of people looking into magic land. In fact, you've read this here. I was thinking, actually, in modern context, there's Ursula with the opening story of the auction of the world. I'm fairly sure there's lots of others but it's always had been, but it is almost common elements of get sort of in the steward of story. I, th I think you're right that, you know, if you strip it, it depends how far you strip down the story. If you literally just strip it down to the basic mortal travels into other world, you will find that in any culture. You'll find that in South America, in Australia, wherever. If you kind of then bring back in the next level, I think that is where you will find that these... Um, Call it the tropes, the elements, do appear to have more linkages. And it's also, I think, to do with how old the first recording of these stories are. I think that's, that was kind of the main sort of point I was trying to argue. Right, I'm going to take two more questions. We've got people queuing outside, Catherine and then Gentle on the left. Yeah. Right, I've got a couple of observations. <laughs> yes, um, first of all, another connection that struck me is with Odysseus and mm -hmm. Calypso, mm -hmm. another supernatural female. Um, in charge of an island, and Odysseus, uh, he stays there. There isn't the time issue, but uh, he is offered eternal life, 
but he's homesick, he's weeping by the shore, and eventually she lets him go. Um, there is eventually, I mean, there will be parts of that point, but you've got, again, those fundamental elements. And, yeah. Sorry, can you come the, I mean, to, to your previous point, the, the fundamental element there seems to be it is always a human male yeah. encounters a supernatural female. Yeah. And it's yes. only in some later medieval literary type myths when you start getting a bit of the reverse, but then it tends to be a kidnapping of the human female. Yeah. Yes. But it's always, yeah, and even in Tolkien's story, um, Thingol, yes, he's an elf, but he has to go one step up. Melia is a Maya, yeah, so it's always that imbalance the female deity, spirit, yeah. or whatever is always one. Okay, I'm going to take but, one yeah. last one because then we have to, because loads of people outside just jump on the left, and then if you want to catch up in the bar or yeah. elsewhere. because there's some stuff that I skipped, um, which somebody, oh gosh, but David Harvey in the song Middle of had argued years ago, um, because that Tolkien's use of these universal myths, these archetypes, um, fits in with Tolkien's idea of the natural theology, which was popular at the time. So it's a way of trying to turn things around with the happy ending, which rarely appears in fairy stories. Tolkien's making such a big deal about it because it fits in with the natural theology. Thank you so much. I'm sorry we have to cut it out short there, but um, fantastic and very interesting.